And so we're still continuing in this series, uh, Christian Unity. And this will be the last sermon in the little mini-series of this on leadership. Uh, We've kind of bounced around a lot, but we've looked at examples of senior leadership. We looked at examples of junior leadership. Tonight, uh, we're looking at something a little different. We're looking at faithless leadership. A lot of things happened in Nehemiah 13 that could have been prevented if the leadership would have stayed focused on the Lord. But as we get started, does anybody know anything about or have any experience with dog sledding? Well, I didn't either, but this example was coming to mind when I was putting these notes together, and I couldn't get rid of it until I started doing some research. And the person who actually drives a sled is is the, the one lone human on there is called a musher. I did not know that either. But the dogs, all they know is to run. That's all they know to do. It's the musher's job to guide them, keep them on the path, all this, keep them from fighting, make sure they eat, make sure they're taken care of, all this stuff. Where would that sled be if there were no musher? They would just run. And who knows where they would end up, what would happen to them or anything like that. So the musher, the leader of that, is a very vital, important part. And we're going to see here in Nehemiah 13 what happens when the leadership isn't present or they're not following the Lord. So let's let's look at the text. So Nehemiah 13 says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine and oil, which were given by commandment, to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king, and after some time I asked leave of the king, and came to Jerusalem, and I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chamber, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padiah, of the Levites, and as their assistants, Hanan, the son of Zakor, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to the brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, 
And do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days I saw in Judah people trading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys. And also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing? profaning the sabbath day did not your fathers act in the same way and did not our god bring all this disaster on us and on this city now you are bringing more wrath on israel by profaning the sabbath as soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of jerusalem before the sabbath i commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the sabbath and I stationed some of my servants at the gates, that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside of Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod. And they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations... There was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we then listen to what you, to listen to you, excuse me, listen to you, and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and the Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. So there is a lot packed into this one chapter. Nehemiah, when he first got leave from King Artaxerxes, went to Jerusalem, got started rebuilding the wall, all this. By the time we hit this point, the wall's finished, everything's good, but he had to return back because his time that he asked for was, was up. He goes back to the king, he asks for more leave, and when he comes back, this is what he finds. Chaos, basically. To, to, to put it plainly, chaos. And if you read... Ezra 9 and 10, which is the last two chapters of Ezra, Ezra goes into more detail about the intermarriage with the foreign people and how he lamented over it and prayed about it and all this. But everyone was marrying 
outside of the Israelite lines. They were married. They were all marrying Levites, everybody. It was crazy. It reminds me, like at the end of, I think, each chapter of Judges where it says, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. That's what they were doing. They lost sight of God. Even the leadership lost sight. So it was just a free-for-all. Just do whatever you want to. Which is the first point that I wanted to make. When leadership is not following God, or there just is no leadership, chaos is what comes. Chaos is what ensues. So any leadership that gets put into place, senior, junior, or even just over your family, it's very important to vet that leadership. We saw examples in the previous sermons where in Acts they laid hands on them and prayed and confirmed that that's who they wanted in that junior leadership position. We also, through other examples, see that with some of the senior leadership. In the Old Testament, we see the senior leadership being called directly by God. So it's very important to vet those those leaders. It's also important for the leadership to stay in the will of God. So here in Nehemiah, they had lost track, if you will, of the law. They said, I don't know if I really want to follow that. So they kind of started doing whatever they wanted to. If they would have stayed in line with that as best they could, a lot of this could have been prevented. We see another example of this in Exodus 32 when Moses was on Mount Sinai and the Israelites turned to false gods. They actually had Aaron, who was supposed to be the chief priest at the time, make a golden calf for them. And it's Exodus 32, verses 1 and 2. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. He then took those, cast them in the fire, and cast a golden calf. And not long after that, Moses comes down and finds all the chaos that is going on at that time and has to set things straight. And Moses wasn't even up there that long. So that shows you just how quick things can go crazy. Even in the New Testament, in Galatians 3, 1, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. He said, Who has bewitched you? Who has turned you from the doctrine that I teach, that I taught you? Who has gotten you going going astray here in Acts 20 verses 29 through 31 I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them therefore be alert remembering that the, for the three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So this was when Paul was coming back to Jerusalem and he was meeting with the elders at Ephesus. Paul knew then something was going to happen when he removed himself, or I guess I should say when God removed him, sent him to Jerusalem and then eventually Rome, something, one of the elders multiple elders from that church in Ephesus was going to turn away. And he was warning them, telling them to be alert, stay alert. 
Also, we see in Nehemiah, leadership has to be very careful with who they ally with. So, verse 4 says, Eliashib, the priest, he allied with Tobiah. Previous chapters, and we will get to this in a few weeks, Tobiah was one of the ones who opposed rebuilding the wall. And he sent a lot, he was involved with sending a lot of letters and threats and things to Nehemiah to try to get him to stop the building the wall but one of the priests had allied with him moved him into the temple in first timothy 120 it says among who are hymenaeus and alexander whom i have handed over to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme so even paul had to be careful with who he allied with And there are times when once you see someone's true personality, their true intentions, that as a leader, we may have to separate ourselves from them. We may have to say, okay, you don't seem to be repentant. You don't seem to be wanting to follow what the Lord wants. I've got to separate myself from you. We see another example of that in 2 Timothy 1.15. It says, You are aware that all those who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So Paul named two more people who he had to distance himself from. He didn't keep pursuing them because it was evident that They didn't want anything to do with the Lord. So leadership, we can't just blindly trust everyone. We we have to be discerning as to who we trust. We have to be discerning as to who we call our friends and who we bring into our inner circle. And sometimes that also means that we have to cut ties with people for our own health For the health of our family and for the health of our church. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25 says, Make no friendships with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Those that we spend the most time around, we will eventually start to have some of their traits rub off on us. So if we hang around someone who is always angry, we will start to pick that up. And it says anger here. But really, we can put any sin into that blank. If if man is given to covetousness, and every time we're around him, oh, look at that. That's awesome. I'd love to have one of those. I really need one of those. And just repeatedly, we eventually start to pick up that habit. So we have to be careful as to who we spend our time with. And it doesn't mean that we need to completely cut ties with all sinners because then we would just be by ourselves all the time. But this is for anyone who refuses to change, who absolutely is dead set against it, just like Paul, naming these other four gentlemen, they were completely against it. He's okay, if you're against it, then we have to cut ties until a future date. Maybe the Holy Spirit turns you around, maybe he doesn't, I don't know, but for now, we have to go our separate ways in Galatians 6 1 it says brothers if anyone is caught in a transgression you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted so even Paul knew that just us interacting with each other and we're all sinners 
if we spend enough time around someone, even trying to help them, we need to watch ourselves so that we don't fall into that temptation. That temptation, that sin, it's like gravity. It's always pulling us down. And I had another good analogy uh, from someone very close to me sitting right over there. She said, it's kind of like if you had a fruit basket and you had an orange that was starting to get a little mold on it. Well, the mold's not going to stop unless someone, the Holy Spirit, intervenes in that person's life. But you need to get that moldy orange out of the basket before that mold spreads to the rest of the fruit that's in the basket. So there are some times when leadership over a family or over a church needs to take that step and say, that person or those people, whatever the case is, they're not healthy for us, and we need to distance ourselves from them. Strong, godly leadership will set things right. So we saw where Nehemiah come in, and he set nobles down, asking them tough questions. He went through, ran to buy out of the temple, cleaned it out, reset all of that like it was supposed to be according to the law. He probably wasn't a very popular man. But sometimes leadership will have to do the unpopular things. They will have to say the hard things. I, I especially like uh, verse 21. Nehemiah said that he was going to lay hands on them. I am pretty sure he is not talking about laying hands on them in prayer. Uh, now, I, I'm not condoning violence. Uh, not by any means. Uh, but where I come from, we call that putting pop knots on somebody's head. Uh, absolute worst case scenario. Follow what the Holy Spirit and your conscience tell you, but I'm not condoning violence. Uh, but I do find that very interesting that he he did uh, mention that to those traitors and stuff that were trying to get in on the Sabbath. But we also see that uh, that sort of mentality, basically doing whatever it takes to keep God's law, is not something new. In Second Samuel 6, verses 1 and 2, it said, David, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. So David took 30,000 men with him to bring the ark of the covenant back to Jerusalem. He was ready to do whatever it took to get the ark back where it was supposed to be, like God had intended. One of the most well-known uh, examples of this and one of my favorite is in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So even Jesus, our perfect leader, set things right. When things aren't the way God intends them to be, leaders step up and set it right. What's really interesting is in John chapter 2, John gives the same account of Jesus in the temple. 
But John makes note that Jesus took the time to make a whip. How mad do you have to be to make a whip? He was like, as soon as I get this whip made, y'all better be cleared out by then. You know, that's 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 something there. <laughs> but godly leadership will always set things right. And they will make sure that everyone in their family, in their church flock, is always looking to Jesus and doing the best that they can to stay focused and never breaking that. When we looked at the churches in Revelations, we saw some more examples of this. We saw Jesus telling these churches, this is what's wrong and you need to fix it. For example, in Revelations 2, 5, for the church at Ephesus, said, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So Jesus is telling him, you need to fix this problem. Or consequences are going to happen. In Revelations 2.16, for Pergamum, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you. I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Again, you have a problem, and your leadership needs to fix it. Revelations 2, verse 22, the church at Thyatira. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. Again, problem, solution. The thing that is needed is leadership to step up. Revelations 3.3, 3, for Sardis, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come to you like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Problem, solution. Revelations 3.19, for Laodicea, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Problem, solution. The main factor is that leadership had lost sight of God in these churches. Some way, somehow, they lost that line of sight on God. So they started to waver. And then all those that they led wavered even more. And these warnings can be applied to our families and our churches and anywhere else where we hold a leadership. And all leadership should heed God's warning because leaders are held to a much higher standard than the average person. In Jeremiah 23, verses 1 and 2, and also in verse 4, he says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. And in verse 4, he says, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. God is warning the shepherds that were there in Israel at the time to not scatter his sheep. And this also, because when we think scattered, we think physically, physical distance. But it's not just that, it's spiritual our spiritual distance from God. If we're not following Him, we're spiritually far away from Him and have been scattered. So when we see 
that word scatter, it's not just physical, it's spiritual. And that can be from bad teaching, that can be from bad examples, that can be from other outside influences that are allowed to come in, anything like that. In Jeremiah 10, verse 21, it says, For the shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, they have not pr prospered, and all their flock is scattered. He says, They do not inquire of the Lord. Those shepherds have lost their sight on God. They've gotten caught up with all kinds of other stuff. In Jeremiah three fifteen, it says, And I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. God is calling Israel to repent. And he's given them a warning that they're being led astray by bad shepherds. Those bad shepherds are scattering them. And God doesn't tolerate bad shepherds. And we see this in all the examples, both in the Old Testament and the New. There's a couple of Proverbs that can give us a little warning too. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors there is safety. So, if there are people who call themselves leaders but aren't leading... The people are going to fall. The flock is going to get scattered. But if they maintain their relationship with the Lord, if they keep their eyes focused, all the counselors, all the leaders, there's safety in that. There's safety for the counselors because then they can rely on each other as well to help keep them focused. That unity is key. Proverbs twenty nine twelve says is if a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. So the head of the house, the man, he is a leader of the household. His wife is a leader as well. But him being the head, if he listens to falsehood, He's going to cause everyone under him to turn wicked, to turn away from the Lord. The same in the church. If the head of the church, that head pastor, does that, then the whole church is going to go off in one way or the other. So are we, as leaders, guiding our family or our church flock in accordance with God's word. Are we as leaders. Consulting other leaders. And our wise counsel. And are we listening to the Holy Spirit. Or are we listening to some other spirit. Leadership. No matter what level. No matter where we're at. No matter what God has called us to, we need to stay focused on God and the path that he has set before us. For our church, for our family, for ourselves individually. A great example of how this works is in Matthew 14, verses 28 and 30. It says, And Peter answered him, Lord, if, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. As long as Peter was focused on Jesus, he was walking on water. Just like Jesus. Nothing was getting to him. It was when he lost sight of Jesus and started focusing on the wind and the waves, a little fear creeped in. His faith started to dwindle a little bit, and he started to sink. As leaders, we have to stay focused on God. 
if we waver just a little bit, we start to sink. The weight of all that upside down pyramid that we talked about, the weight of all that leadership, all that responsibility starts to crush us if we don't stay focused on Jesus. At the end of Nehemiah, we see him finish the book and say one thing. Remember me, oh my God, for good. Can we as leaders think of what good people will remember us for? Can we say, God will remember me for this good? Fill in the blank with, can we say that? All levels of leadership have immense burdens. They face more attacks from the enemy than just your average Christian. And they're held to a higher standard for both the teaching and the leading that they do. We must continue to pray for them always that God will grant them the strength to withstand the enemy and the wisdom to guide the flocks in God's will. And I thought that that was the closing statement of this sermon. Um, but the Lord wanted me to add a little bit more. There's a passage uh, from a book that I'm reading right now titled The Reformed Pastor by Richard Baxter. The name says The Reformed Pastor, but the book is on leadership, godly leadership. And this section is a chilling reminder for all leaders. And it says, Take heed to yourself, because the tempter will more ply you with his temptations than other men. If you will be the leaders against the prince of darkness, he will spare you no further than God restraineth him. He beareth the greatest malice to those that are engaged to do him the greatest mischief. As he hateth Christ more than any of us, because he is the general of the field, the captain of our salvation, and doth more than all the world besides against his kingdom, so doth he hate the leaders under him more than the common soldier. He knows what a rout he will make among them if the leaders fall before their eyes. He hath long tried that way of fighting neither against great nor small comparatively but of smiting the shepherds that he may scatter the flock and so great hath been his success this way that he will continue to follow it for as far as he is able take heed therefore brethren for the enemy hath a special eye on you you shall have his most subtle insinuations and incessant solicitations and violent assaults. As wise and learned as you are, take heed to yourself lest he outwit you. The devil is a greater scholar than you and a nimbler disputant. He can transform himself into an angel of light to deceive. He will get within you and trip up your heels before you are aware. He will play the juggler with you undiscerned. And cheat you of your faith or innocency. And you shall not know that you have lost it. Nay, he will make you believe it is multiplied and increased when it is actually lost. You shall see neither hook nor line, much less the subtle angler himself. While he to your temper and his bait. And his bait shall be so fitted to your temper and disposition that he will be sure to find advantages within you and make your own principles and inclinations betray you. And whenever he ruineth you, he will make you the instruments of ruin to others. Oh, what a conquest he will think he hath got if he can make a minister lazy and unfaithful. If he can tempt a minister into covetousness or scandal, he will glory against the church and say, these are your holy preachers. See what their preciseness is and whither it brings them. 
he will glory against Jesus Christ himself and say, These are thy champions. I can make thy chiefest servants abuse thee. I can make the stewards of thy house unfaithful. If he did so insult God upon the false surmise and tell him that he could make Job curse him to his face, what will he do if he should prevail against you? That really makes you stop and think. The stronger the leader, the higher level of leadership you are called to, the harder and more vicious the devil will come after you. He will come after you harder and harder than anyone on a lower tier. So before I ask this last question, just as a thought, I'm going to close this in prayer. And if anybody would like to pray and come up, you're more than welcome to. But after going through all this leadership, after seeing good examples, bad examples, all all of this, the higher level that you're called to, the more turmoil the devil's going to throw at you. So what does it say then? If you're in a leadership position and the enemy isn't coming after you. And with that, I'll close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight, Lord, and we just want to thank you again for this message that you brought to us. We thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to gather here in your name. And Lord, we ask that you just help us all to remember the lessons that you wanted us to take from this. Help us all to apply these things to our life, Lord. And help us all to, to see where we can be better leaders for you. And Lord, I just ask that as we leave here and travel home, that you just be with all of us and watch over us and help us to get home safely. And I ask, Lord, that you be with all of our church family, even those who aren't here, and just watch over them and protect them and bless them all, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that you continue to to be here with us, Lord, and, and move amongst us. And I just pray, Lord, that you stir us all up and help us all to reignite our fires for you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.